present The Adventures of Ellery Queen. <laughs> Bromo Seltzer bring you another thrilling adventure with Ellery Queen, the celebrated gentleman detective in person. Ellery Queen again gives you a chance to match wits with him as he relates another story of a crime he alone unraveled. Then, at the point where he was able to solve the mystery, he stops the play, gives you a chance to guess the criminal's name. In the studio tonight, we have as our guests Mr. George R. Crowley, superintendent of the New York, New Haven, and Hartford Railroad Police Force, and Mr. F. Beverly Kelly, director of radio publicity for the Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey combined shows. Mr. Crowley and Mr. Kelly have accepted Ellery Queen's challenge to solve the mystery before the solution is revealed. And now, Ellery Queen, Master Detective and your host for the next half hour. Good evening. In tonight's story, we run across one of the boldest and most dastardly murders in our memory. A murder on a speeding train. And among our suspects are included a giant, a midget, and a fortune teller. I call it The Adventure of the Circus Train. <laughs> Sure glad this Chicago case is wrapped up, Inspector. Yes, Bailey, it'll be good to get back to New York. Harry, can I take it? Just that. Ever know Ellery to forget anything? <laughs> Here's our pullman. Oh, who's this? I'm the station master. May I see your ticket? Oh, that's right. Oh, sir. Sorry, Mr. Queen. The Army's requisitioned all available space on this train. Your reservations are canceled. Oh, oh canceled. How about the next train, station master? Well, the earliest accommodations available are on the special section of the 11.59 tonight, Mr. Queen. It has three compartments left. We'll take them. I'd better tell you about it first, sir. That section's carrying Marco's mammoth show, the Midwest Circus outfit. Oh, that'll be fun. You mean we have to travel with tigers and elephants and get sawdust in our hair? <laughs> Not quite, miss. Your accommodations would be in the end car. It's an all-compartment car with a small lounge and bar at the rear. Mr. Marco himself travels in that car and his business manager, John Brady. Well, we certainly don't object to traveling with Mr. Marco and Mr. Brady, Station Master. Uh, but they're not the only ones in that car, sir. Look, if I got to double up with a talking snake, I'll walk to them. <laughs> Who are the others? Well, there's Goliath. He's eight foot tall. Goliath? The circus giant? Yes, miss. Then there's Captain Pinky. He's a midget. And Madam Zara. She's the circus fortune teller. They're nice folks. Been with Marco's Circus a long time, but I thought I'd tell you. Well, ever since I was a kid, I've had a yen to travel with the circus. What do you say? Well, we don't mind one bet, Station Master. Okay, Mr. Queen, I'll fix it. <laughs> Ought to be an interesting trip. <laughs> This is solid cover. My, this lounge back here is awfully cozy, Ellery. Yes, we should be pulling out soon, Nikki. Mr. Marco, I hope we're not putting you out in any way. Oh, can't expect normal conditions in wartime, yes. Inspector. Edward? Yes, sir? Edward, shut him up. Yes, sir. We're having a little celebration, folks. Well, in that case, maybe we ought to get out of the lounge and go to our compartments, Mr. Mark. Yes, we don't want to spoil any plans you have. No, I won't have it. Be mighty proud if you don't join me, in fact. Well, I'll well, do it, Oh, well, John. Yes? He says, <laughs> did you tell him all about it? Oh, I left the telling to you, Mark. Uh, folks, meet John Brady, my business manager. Uh, howdy, folks. Howdy, howdy, and uh, this is Long Joe Stebbins, professionally known as Mr. Goliath. Hello, Mr. Goliath. Uh, Madam Zara, the smartest crystal gazer under the big tops. How do you do? And uh, Captain Pinky, 44 years old, and you can put him in your vest pocket. Any friend of Mark Marcos is a friend of mine. Uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 you three must be wondering what this is all about. We are. As you know, I've been in show business over 50 years. Well... Mark Marco's getting too old to run a circus. Oh, oh, yeah, I know, I know, but I am. Needs younger blood. So I've just sold Marco's mammoth show to John Brady here. Yes, I'm right. Uh, John, here's the bill of sale. Whole work signed, sealed, and delivered. Well, thanks, Mark. And uh, here's my advance payment in cash. $30,000. Oh, hey, Boy, thank you, Goliath. Will you look at that? Three $10,000 bills. I ain't never seen so much money, Captain Pinky. Money means trouble. I smell trouble. <laughs> I smell an Indiana farm and rest for my old bones, Zara. Right. Well, folks, drink up. You good help, Mr. Marco? Oh, thank you. One minute to midnight. We're leaving on the dock. How about a song for Mr. Marco? Oh, oh he's a jolly good fellow. Oh, he's a jolly good fellow. Oh, he's a jolly good fellow. Pretty late, Maestro. 
us about we get the hazy ways. Well, I suppose we may as well, Sergeant. What's bothering you, Henry? Why do you want to come out here in the front platform of the car? To clear my head, Dad. There was an atmosphere in the lounge I didn't like. You mean them expressions of gimme gimme on the faces of the giant, the midget, and Madame's are? Oh, that's only natural, son. These circus people don't see ten thousand dollar bills every day. Not only circus people. Uh, gentlemen, sir. What's the matter, brother? I, I, I was just cleaning up my bar in the lounge, sir. Yes. I, I guess the bell signal from Mr. Markle's compartment. Spit the pebbles out of your mouth, Henry. I, I rang his bell. There's no answer. I tried the door. It was on. I opened the door and I saw. I, I saw. The man's here, Let's go see for ourselves. Come on. Here's Mr. Marco's compartment. Dad, look. Marco. His head dashed in. Right there. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the beginning of our story. We'll be back in just a moment to tell you more, but first, Ernest Chappell with a mystery of his own. And it bids fair to be as baffling as any mystery ever he's been up against. By the way, folks, what's your batting average? Mrs. Neely Jarvie of Lakewood, Ohio, is frank to admit that she and her family haven't piled up a very imposing score of correct deductions, but she says they still get a big kick out of trying to decide who done it. Ah, good for you, Mrs. Jarvie. That's what we like to hear. And here's something else we like to hear. Uh, but suppose I let you folks have it in Mrs. Jarvie's own words. She writes? We're never without promo seltzer in our home. And not long ago, when I became a volunteer nurse at our local hospital, I had just one more reason to be grateful for bromo seltzer's quick, effective relief. After my first evening of routine floor work, I came home with my nerves on edge and a bad headache, brought on by nervous excitement. Well, as soon as I got in the house, I took a bromo seltzer. And oh, what relief... I'm not so nervous and excited about my volunteer work as I was at first, but I know that I can rely on bromo seltzer whenever I have a common sick headache like that again. Well, now, there you have a mighty fine piece of advice from a lady who ought to know. So the next time you have a common sick headache, try bromo seltzer. I bet you'll feel the same as Mrs. Jarvie about it. And say, we'd like to hear from all of you about your bromo seltzer experiences. Just send your letters to Ellery Queen, care of the station to which you are listening. <laughs> to our story. It's a short time after the discovery of old Mr. Marco's body. The car has been locked, front and rear. Nikki has been awakened. But, but Inspector, how did it happen? That's what we've got to figure out, Nikki. Hillary Vili and I were standing on the front platform from the time the party in the lounge here broke up. And we know no one from the forward cars came into our car or left it. And the two conductors were sitting at the end of the lounge near the rear platform, Nikki, checking their tickets. And both conductors say no one got into the car through the back. So, Mr. Marco must have been murdered by someone in this car. That's the size of it, Nikki. But who? Which one? The two conductors alibi each other, and they both alibi the porter. So the killer must be one of the four circus people. That nice old man. Why? Don't you remember Brady handing Marco three $10,000 bills in front of our eyes, Nikki? And they're not in his wallet now or anywhere in Marco's compartment. He was bumped off for that thirty grand, Miss P. Killer probably wrapped on Marco's door. Marco let him in. Visitor assaulted the old man, stole the money, and left Marco for dead. But he didn't die right off. He managed to reach the porter's bell and ring it before dying. What was the weapon, Inspector? A man's shoe. What? Yes, a shoe. A shoe big enough to ship freight in, Miss Porter. A man's shoe. Size 22, Nikki. Size 22? But a shoe that size, it must be the giant. Goliath must have killed Mr. Marco. And used his own shoe, Miss Porter? And to top it off, left it in Marco's room for us to find? No killer would be so simple-minded, Nicky. The big boy's being framed. Only question is, by who? Well, Dad, we better start asking questions. Yes. Billy? Yeah? Call them out of their compartments one at a time. While we're attacking each one, you search his compartment for that dough. Okay, Inspector. Well, son, this case is a cinch. Marco was killed for the 30 grand. So when we find the cash, we find the killer. Oh, Mr. Glass. Mm -hmm. Sorry, the sergeant had to wake you. Oh, what time is it for crime when he said? Ellery, he's hobbling. You'd hobble too, Nicky, if you were wearing only one shoe. How come you got on only one shoe, Mr. Glass? Oh, darn if I know, Inspector. When I went to bed, I put my shoes in that little do-jigger on the floor of the compartment. I know, I know. There's a little closet, you know, yeah. that the porter can open from outside and take out your shoes and shine them during the night. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, sir, just now Mr. Bealy comes fetching me, and 
I look for my shoes, and that shoe thing draw gone if somebody ain't stole one of my shoes. So what am I going to do? It's the only pair I got. We hit Pittsburgh in the morning, Mr. Clive. So we'll send out a pair of shoes for you then. Huh. There ain't a shoe store in Pittsburgh or anywhere else carries size 22. I don't... Oh, Inspector, what do you want me for? Come into Marker's room, Goliath, and I'll show you. Sure, sure. Ellery, I, I can't look. Stay out in the car, Nicky. Well, where's Mr. Marker, Inspector? What's under that piece of newspaper? Yes? Mm-hmm. Your shoe, Mr. Goliath. Well, I'll be... I... What's blood doing all over? What's under that blanket? Mr. Marco, he was murdered tonight... With your shoe. Hmm. <laughs> Murdered? Uh... What happened in there? Goliath fainted, Henry. Revive this eight-foot key man. Right, Dad. And Nicky, call John Brady in here. <laughs> Too. Somebody stole one of my shoes. From your shoe compartment, Mr. Brady? That's right. I found two shoes in it, all right, but one of them's a woman's. Here, look. Hey, what's going on? Hey, Mark, you in there? Just a moment, Mr. Brady. Nikki, is this woman's shoe Mr. Brady just found a shoe receptacle yours? No, Inspector. It must be Madam Zahn. Nikki, you better go fetch the Zahn woman. All right. Suppose you go in now, Mr. Brady, and see Mr. Marco. I don't get all this. I... Marco. Marco. Put the blanket back, Henry. Right, Dad. But who? Why? The thirty thousand dollars you handed Marco tonight, Mr. Brady. That's why. Inspector, Madam Zara is hopping mad about her shoe, and I mean hopping. I don't care for jokes, if you please. Mr. Brady, is this your shoe? I just found it in my shoe compartment, and one of mine is gone. Let me see. Yes, sir. That's my shoe. Here's yours. Thank you. What was I awakened in the middle of the night? Has has anything happened to Mr. Marco? Why do you ask that, Madam Zara? Yes. Of course. Mr. Marco is lying under that blanket. He's dead, isn't he? Yes, Madame Zara. Look. I should have warned him. You knew Marco was going to be knocked off? Before retiring, I looked into my crystal ball. It never lies. I saw an old man lying there dead. Now I realize it was Mr. Marco. An old man blood on his head. Don't mind her. She always talks like this. You saw this in your crystal ball, you say? With blood on his head. Did you also see Marco's murder in your magic ball, Madame Zara? No. But I could. Really? If the conditions were right, yes, Mr. Queen. Help. Help. Glad I sing murders in a hunk of glass. Zara, go back to your room. You too, Mr. Brady. Very well, Mr. Crystal ball. Where's Vili? In the name of Houdini, isn't he back with that 30 grand? Haven't you forgotten someone, Inspector? Who, Nick? Captain Pinky, the midget. Oh, the midget couldn't have done it. He's too tiny. He could have stood on something, Dad. And that big heavy shoe would be a murderous weapon even in the hands of a child. Mr. Marco, what's all the excitement about? It's Captain Pinky. Hello. What the devil's going on? Why is everybody rushing around like crazy? It's an unusual trip, Captain Pinky. By the way, anybody swipe your shoes? My shoes? Heck no. What would anybody want with my shoes? What blasted all? What's happened? Mr. Marco's been murdered, Captain. Mr. Marco? Murdered? Murdered? Oh, dear, he's crying. Midgets, giants, crystal balls. Inspector. Vivi, well, where'd you find the money? I didn't find it, Inspector. You did? <coughs> I searched every compartment, no doubt. Could you find your head? Huh? Where are we now? A half hour out of Fort Wayne, Indiana. At the next stop, wire Pittsburgh to have some detectives waiting for us when we pull in tomorrow morning. And give this car and everybody in it a vacuum cleaning, Bailey. Even if the Pittsburgh boys have to go to New York with us. Very well, sir. Yes, bar. I'll show you how to solve this case, Henry. Find that money, and you've got Marco's murderer. Philadelphia. Time's keeping Bailey and those Pittsburgh men. Still searching after ten hours. But it must be in this car. Dad. Dad, I've got it. 
With the money, yes, sir? No, no, I mean the explanation for that shoe incident. Huh? Killer wanted a weapon that couldn't be traced to him. So he stole one of Zara's shoes from her receptacle. But realized it was too light as a weapon. So he rifled Brady's shoe receptacle. And then decided he wouldn't use either ones. He'd use Goliath's shoe. That would make a weapon. So he stole Goliath's shoe. And then putting back Mr. Brady's and Madame Zara's... He made a mistake and mixed them up. Inspector Queen. Yes? Oh, good night. How much longer do I have to walk around in my socks? I want my shoe. We're checking it for fingerprints, Mr. Glass. You'll have it back by the time we reach New York. Well, would you wash the blood off? Sure, sure, Mr. Glass. Right, Mr. Glass. I made up my mind. I'm arresting Zara. Why Zara, Dad? She knew Marco was dead. The only one who did. How could she have known unless she bumped him off? Well, that is a puzzle, how she knew. Dad, she claims she might see the criminal in her crystal ball. Why not call her bluff? See whom she accuses. Hmm. That's an idea. Okay, we're trying. I have a hunch Madame Zara has something up her sleeve, and it isn't a crystal ball. Madame Zara, why is it you people can't ever do anything in the light? We consult other worlds. Light is a disturbance. I must have darkness. No, Chris Focus. Conductor. Yes? Switch the lights off here in the lounge. But tell Sergeant Billy to have both ends of the car watch. Yes, sir. You will all join hands. This is silly, Ellery. She knows it's silly, too, Nikki. Zara's trying to tell us something, using the seance as a cloak. <gasps> there go the lights. I must have quiet, or my crystal will tell me nothing. Come, appear. You who shed Marco's blood, appear in the crystal of truth. Ellery, it's getting a faint glow. Phosphorus, Nikki. Truth. Quiet. The one who spills the blood of old men, he takes shape. Face. It comes out of a mist. In a moment now, I see him. I see him. Much obliged, Madame Zara. Who done it? The spiller of blood is. Madame Zara, why do you stop? Time. Hey, what What's are the you doing? Turn on those lights. Hillary, do you think she. Hear the lights. Zara. She's sitting so still. Time. Come out of that now. She's in one of our trances. Oh, no, I thought she was dead, Mr. Brady. Gosh, Captain Piggy, so did I. Wake up, Zara. Uh, Thank goodness. Whose face did you see in that thing? I must not tell you. Not yet. Oh. And why not yet? The time isn't right. I... I perhaps later. Madam Zary, you're a first-class fake. Fake? I'm not going to stay around here and be insulted. All of you, back to your compartments. Oh, I don't think this is fake. Oh, that's that, Eric. Oh, oh, really? Well? Boy, am I poop. Find the money, Sergeant. Those Pittsburgh guys and me, we've gone over this car three times. No dough. What? Me? Look, Inspector, we tore those blame compartments practically apart. You saw how we searched this lounge, the bar, the porter's pantry, the light fixtures, the radio, the fr... Well, do you want me to go on? How about the people, Sergeant? Yeah, head to toe. Clothes, luggage, cigarettes. We even examined Sarah's crystal ball. No, we searched the two conductors and the porter, too. No dough. Meaning you're a crook's idea of Santa Claus. Huh? Start all over again. I want that $30,000 before we reach New York. We're in. End of the line. Ellery, where do you suppose that stolen money is? I can't imagine, Nicky. Poor Dad. That must be the inspector's own squad waiting on the platform. Now, is everybody here? Yeah. Ready, go on. Frankie? Where's Madam Hocus Pocus? That's Sarah woman. Huh? She isn't here, Inspector. But you must know we're in. The train stopped. That's up to now. Billy, get her out here. Okay. Hey, Sarah! Inspector! Nikki, don't look. Dead. Sarah's been bumped off. Head smashed in with a crystal ball. Billy, hold everybody. All right. Nobody wait. Uh, who'd have thought? But why, Madam Zara? It's clear now. We wondered how Zara knew about Marco's being dead. Don't you see? Zara must have spied on the murder in the corridor last night. She must have seen the killer go into Marco's room with Goliath's shoe. Then why didn't she tell him? Because she had her own axe to grind, Nikki. The seance was a veiled threat to the killer. She was warning him she could give him away if she chose. So that he'd split the 30 grand with her. But instead, he split her head open. Wait a minute. Of course. Now I see it all. We've been blind. Ellery. Been destroyed. Thank you very much, Mr. Crowley and Mr. Kelly. In a moment, you'll learn what the correct solution is. But first, the search for an honest man has come to an end in the person of our own Ernest Chappell. Oh, oh, me. What Ellery undoubtedly means is that I'm not going to make a single claim for Bromo Seltzer that isn't absolutely true. I'm not going to tell you that it'll do all your errands and finish your housework for you. But I do say there's just nothing better than Bromo Seltzer for common sick headaches. 
You know the kind. Pounding head pain, jumpy nerves, upset stomach. Well, Bromo Seltzer fights headache like that three ways. You get effective relief. Quickly feel more like your old self. So be prepared. Keep Bromo Seltzer handy where you work as well as at home. Sit down, you people. Okay, Inspector. Here's the way this case stacks up. We know the killer wanted a weapon that couldn't be traced to him. So what did he pick? Somebody else's shoe. Mark that. Somebody else's shoe. So whatever shoe or shoes he stole last night belonged to innocent people. Not to the murderer. Only Makes man. sense to me, Arthur. Hush, Nicky, I want to follow this. Whose shoes were stolen last night? Madam Zars. So she's innocent. Mr. Brady's. So he's innocent. And finally, Goliath's. So he's innocent. Who's left who could be the guilty man? Only Captain Pinky. Uh, Captain Pinky, where'd you hide that doll? But I didn't kill Mr. Marco. Uh, Dad, haven't you left out one possibility? What possibility, son? That, that the murderer wanted you to think just what you do think. That the crime was committed by the one person whose shoe was not involved. He deliberately involved all the shoes but Captain Pinky's. He was framing Pinky? I'm afraid so, Dad. The big point of this case is one you made yourself repeatedly. That to find the killer, we had to find the money he stole. But we didn't find the money, Sam. And why didn't we? Because it wasn't in the car. But it was in the car, Dad. It had to be. Hurry, the car was practically demolished. Everybody and everything in it was searched. That can't be, Dad, or the $30,000 would have been found. Obviously, then, one place was not searched. So that place is where the missing money must be. What place? Where didn't we search, Maestro? Did you search the weapon, Sergeant? No, Lynch. The weapon that killed Marco? Who'd ever think of searching the weapon? Exactly. That's what the killer figured, too. That we wouldn't dream the hiding place of the money was the very shoe which bashed poor Marco's head in. But, Amory, what good did that do him? How could he expect to get hold of the money again? That shoe was a murder weapon held by the police. Therefore, Nikki, the murderer could be only one person, the owner of the shoe to whom it would eventually be returned. Eventually? Goliath asked for his shoe even before we reached Penn Station. And I just gave it to him. Goliath... Take that murder show off. No, oh, you're wrong. I didn't oh, do yeah. it. Oh, no. Uh, Come on, Daddy. Uh, I, 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 I didn't do it. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. Get this tug boat off. Oh, yeah. I didn't do it. Really? Get out that shoe lining. Yes, sir. And here they are. The three $10,000 bills. Clever crime, Goliath. Because who'd be foolish enough to use his own shoe as a murder weapon and then leave it behind to be found? You knew we'd believe you innocent. You knew we'd therefore return the shoe with its hidden money to you. But there's one thing Goliath didn't know. He didn't know he was traveling with Ellery, the giant killer. (laughs) (laughs) And And there, ladies and gentlemen, you have the solution to the mystery. I want to thank Mr. George R. Crowley and Mr. F. Beverly Kelly for appearing as guest armchair detectives this evening. And we have for both Mr. Crowley and Mr. Kelly a personal gift from Bromo Seltzer, an autographed copy of my new mystery novel, There Was an Old Woman, just out this week, and a subscription to Ellery Queen's Mystery Magazine. Oh, Ellery, I certainly enjoyed that story. I bet you can't top it next week. Uh, I'll take that bet, Chappie, and I'll tell you what it's about in just a moment. Okay, that gives me time enough to introduce my friend and your friend, the one and only educated train known to man, the talking Bromo Seltzer train. I did it! Three ways! Yes, you can't beat that for good sense. Fight headache three ways with Bromo Seltzer. You see, common sick headaches often affect you three ways. Pain in the head, jangling nerves, and upset stomach. But Bromo Seltzer quickly relieves that pain in your head. Bromo Seltzer helps settle jumpy nerves. Bromo Seltzer helps settle upset stomach. Uh, you see what I mean? Three-way misery, three-way relief with Bromo Seltzer. Use it only as directed on the label for frequent or persistent headaches. See your doctor. For common sick headaches, do as millions of others do. Use tried and true Bromo Seltzer. Fight headache three ways. Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer, Bromo Seltzer. Well, now, Ellery, we'll add house for next week. You got something nice and cheerful? Very chappy. In fact, it's a story about a perfect gentleman. That is perfect, except for one little obsession. Yeah, what's that? He wants to murder his wife. Pleasant guy. <laughs> so, Chappy, you better listen again next Saturday for the adventure of The Human Weapon. And don't forget the other great Romo Seltzer show friends, Vox Pop, the show that travels America. 
Next Monday, Box Pop travels to Cheyenne, Wyoming, where Parks Johnson and Warren Hull will interview a flying fortress crew just back from bombing Germany. Consult your local paper for the time and station. Music for the Adventures of Ellery Queen is by Charles Paul. Production is directed by Bruce Cannon. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.